As I think of my education, my first thoughts go to my parents. So I had come out of a multi-generational black educated family. The thing I remember most about my early schooling was my dependence upon one or two teachers. I still remember Miss Perkins, my first grade teacher, and she went out of her way to support me. I can remember some days standing on the playground holding on to her finger. So early on I got tuned into the importance of what I have subsequently written about. I call it supplementary education. It's the education that occurs outside of school. Because as you were talking about your parents' home, it actually made me think about the Institute for Urban and Minority Education. I think of Yumi as a very multi-generational space, and it really has become a kind of intellectual family. Was that deliberate when you founded Yumi? I can't conceive of how I would not. I have always experienced education as having primarily to do with relations between people in which better positioned or more mature, more experienced, the ways in which the people who know help the people who uh, don't know. What do you see as the biggest positive changes in education for students in general and for black students in particular? One of the most consequential changes is the embrace of epigenetic over genetic perspectives on development. When I came into the field, we were actively debating the nature-nurture controversy. One of the primary changes, I think, uh, has been in the conceptions of what is possible in the process of becoming rather than what can be uh, predicted measures of developed ability. I know that you and Dr. Susan were great patrons of artists, um, particularly Charles White, who comes to mind, whose work I admire so much. For both Susan and for me, art was a part of our childhood. parents who were themselves appreciative of art, and even more than that, they were respectful of the artists. My sister and I grew up thinking that artists were people you were supposed to admire and respect and care for. So when about 26 or 27, I ran into another young black artist, Charles White, we almost immediately bonded when he was most productive artistically. Susan and I were helping to pay his rent, to help him to feed his family. And uh, he kind of became a brother to her and to me. And his work, of course, came a part of our soul and spirit. Are there lessons that we can learn from that in, in education? I don't think it is by accident that I became an educator. I take my own experience to mean that these early experiences and especially positive, uh, trusting experiences with accomplished adults um, means a lot through much of my career. I never got far away from Miss Perkins' uh, care of me in first grade. And I related to my students in much the same way, trying to be supported, trying to be there for them, trying to in inspire, trying to protect, trying to lift them higher.
Good morning. I'm Professor Erica Walker, and on behalf of my colleagues, Madhavi Chatterjee and Amy Stewart-Wells, and all of us here at Teachers College, I want to welcome you to the Edmund W. Gordon Centennial Conference, inspired by and in honor of our beloved professor, friend, and mentor, who is turning 100 this month. Happy birthday, Dr. Gordon. Um, thank you so much to everyone from all around the world for joining us for these two days. What a great opportunity it is for all of us to come together to learn not just from Dr. Gordon's ideas and research, but from his vision and leadership. As you'll see from this two-day conference, which focuses on key intertwined aspects of Dr. Gordon's work, pedagogy and assessment, and how we define, use, and reimagine them and their purposes, Ed Gordon has inspired bodies of research, developed and influenced practice and policy, and constantly reminded us of the larger purpose of education and the work we all do as educators, whether we're teaching in K through 12 classrooms, engaging and advocating for our communities, conducting research, or leading initiatives and in institutes. In this morning's opening session, you'll hear from our TC president and provost who have championed Dr. Gordon's work and this conference, more from us as the organizers about how these two days will transpire, and from our good friend and colleague, Michelle knight Manuel, as she is in conversation with our keynote speaker, Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to the president of Teachers College, Tom Bailey. Thank you, Erica, for that kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. It is my great honor to welcome all of you to Teachers College for what promises to be an exciting conference and the most fitting centennial celebration of a most extraordinary human being. The great abolitionist, Frederick Douglass, once said that the three effective ways to fight for justice are agitate, agitate, agitate. Throughout his long accomplished and still very active career as a psychologist, minister, community activist, writer, scholar, researcher, and educator of the first rank, Edmund Gordon has agitated fearlessly to bring about a smarter, healthier, more equitable, and more just society. As agitators for social justice are wont to do, Dr. Gordon has always spoken truth to power. The one truth he has delivered consistently over the years and that continues to inform his work is this. While human beings come into the world with individual strengths and weaknesses, their chances to enjoy meaningful and successful lives are shaped by their circumstances, surroundings, and resources available to them. This truth led Dr. Gordon to champion what he called supplementary education, a holistic approach that viewed all settings, beginning with the home but extending to schools, houses of worship, and numerous community and social settings as theaters for learning. He taught us that when families and communities lack the resources to enrich children's educational experiences outside of school, society has the responsibility to step in and provide those resources in order to support every child's intellectual development. Through his revolutionary scholarship, advocacy, and direct action, Dr. Gordon has taught and led by example over the past eight decades. It would take me the entire day just to summarize all of those accomplishments, so I will mention just three. In the 1950s, Ed teamed up with his remarkable wife, the pediatrician, Dr. Susan Gordon, to launch one of the nation's first comprehensive clinics serving underprivileged children and their families. In 1965, he joined the Johnson administration as research director for Head Start and started writing the Elementary Secondary Education Act. In the 1970s, Dr. Gordon founded the Institute for Urban and Minority Education, the first and among the most influential organizations devoted to empowering communities of color and marginalized populations through advocacy, demonstration, evaluation, information dissemination, research and technical assistance. Today, under the leadership of Dr. Erica Walker, Yumi continues to extend the frontiers of rigorous research that promotes the voices of marginalized peoples and advances social justice and progress. 
Of course, Dr. Gordon, Ed, has never stopped agitating to transform society. Over the past decade, Ed's 10th decade, he led a commission funded by the Educational Testing Service that called for a re-envisioning of standardized testing. Less than two years ago, Ed led a national conference at TC that called for shifting the primary function and focus of educational assessment away from measurement and ranking and towards improving education, teaching, and learning. As Ed said, our premise is that testing should pay as much attention to the cultivation of ability as the measurement of ability. That premise is reflected in the focus of this conference, how to make teaching, learning, and assessment processes in schools ensure the affirmative development of every learner and give everyone equitable opportunities to grow. While none of us can do justice to Ed Gordon's monumental impact on society and our lives, I believe we can offer two fitting 100th birthday tributes. It is my great honor to announce the first tribute. As of today, the Institute for Urban and Minority Education will officially be called the Edmund W. Gordon Institute for Urban and Minority Education. And we are counting on Ed to continue playing a major role in the Gordon Institute's work. The second fitting tribute is yours to make, and that is to apply the insights and learning from this conference towards creating the smarter, healthier, more equitable, and more just world that Ed Gordon already has done so much to bring about. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tom, for opening our conference and sharing that exciting news. All of us at UMI are thrilled about the, lag the lasting legacy of this new name, the Edmund W. Gordon Institute for Urban and Minority Education. It's my pleasure to introduce next our Provost and Dean of Teachers College, Dr. Stephanie Rowley. Good morning. I'm truly honored and delighted to be here with you today to join President Bailey and our amazing organizing committee, Amy Stewart Wells, Madhavi Chatterjee, and Erica Walker in welcoming you to the Edmund W. Gordon Centennial Conference. When I think of the corpus of Dr. Gordon's work, I see his focus as the use of education to allow all humans to flourish and a fundamental belief in the human potential for growth. This may sound like hyperbole, but in reality, Dr. Gordon has always used his training in human development and learning theory to focus on how, this, how to support the disadvantaged, how to include the needs of all learners, and how to use educational tools to expose and leverage potential. Ed has been a critical voice arguing for the importance of affirmative development, as he calls it, for all human beings, and for using testing to guide instruction and learning rather than to measure and rank during a time when the high stakes testing culture has overtaken public education. This clarion call of affirmative development reflects his firm belief in the power of education to emancipate. Thank you, President Bailey, for recounting so many of Dr. Gordon's amazing contributions to the field. On a personal note, the two honors that have touched me the most have been the unveiling of the stunning portrait of Dr. Gordon that hangs right now in Teachers College that was unveiled in 2019, and AERA's recent naming him the first ever honorary president in its 105 year existence. I'm so looking forward to hearing how Dr. Gordon plans to again, touch the field with his brilliance. That we were able to begin this centennial birthday celebration by announcing that the Institute for Urban and Minority Education would be named after him is equally, if not more exciting. Dr. Gordon, you deserve these honors and so many more given your outsized contributions to Teachers College and to the fields of education and psychology and more. I happen to know from Dr. Gordon's example that none of this acclaim is as important as his enduring relationships with previous students. Dr. Gordon is known as a generous mentor and sponsor. I suspect he's maintained contact with the majority of his former students and that even those who are now seasoned professionals continue to call on him for advice and wisdom. As I read through the conference program for the events for today and tomorrow, I'm reminded of the many people who have been and continue to be influenced 
mentored, and inspired by Dr. Gordon. I first became aware of Dr. Gordon's mentorship as I read the work of Howard University professor Wade Boykin, whose work laid out a framework for understanding African American culture. I met Dr. Boykin as a graduate student and remember him sharing stories about Ed's mentorship. In a wonderful full circle moment, Dr. Gordon introduced me to Dr. Boykin's son Malik, another proud Gordon mentee, a new assistant professor at Brown University. The incredible thing is that so many of those who've been touched by Dr. Gordon have then made connections to one another, leading to incredible interdisciplinary intellectual connections. These connections have spurred books, grants, conferences, hours of conversation, and most importantly, change. Just recently, I served on a panel at the American Psychological Society's annual convention with Malik Boykin, talking about reducing racial disparities through psychological research. And so today, we celebrate the birthday of a visionary leader, but more importantly, I hope that these two days serve as a call to arms for educators, psychologists, and others to take up the cause of affirmative development, to consider innovative ways in which we can better serve the needs of children, and to use our collective work for the greater good. Happy birthday, Dr. Gordon. Thank you so much, Provost Rowley. I'm really delighted to have co-organized this conference with my friends and colleagues at TC, Professors Madhavi Chatterjee and Amy Stewart-Wells. Earlier this spring, we sat down for wide-ranging video interviews about Dr. Gordon, his work, and his influence on our careers. So instead of the typical introduction, I'll let Amy and Madhavi introduce themselves, and then you'll hear directly from each of them. By a stroke of serendipity, he was the interim dean when I set foot in the hallways of Teachers College. He was already well known, and I was intimidated by that knowledge. At the same time, he can be so personable, so caring, that it built in me a self-belief that I could gather my inner and other resources, outer resources, and get to work. His lasting contribution, I would say, to my career has been inspiring in me uh, the need to investigate and study deeply issues of educational equity as they intersect with teaching, learning, and assessment. How can we use assessment in an affirmative way rather than in a punitive way? His singular commitment to affirmative development of every learner, that's his major contribution. And he has attacked that problem as an educational psychologist with a humanistic perspective, uh, with a moral imperative, and also as an activist. Having met him, a new theme in my scholarship became looking at educational equity issues deeply. And uh, to try and address that, looking at it as a multidisciplinary problem and a deeply rooted social problem. And not just in American society, right now it is worldwide, really. I owe it to him to begin looking at the achievement gap and issues of educational equity as a deep social problem. That, I believe, is something that I will remain committed to throughout my life. Can you believe it? He is still leading a faculty seminar uh, every Friday for two hours because he felt strongly that some things he wanted to do in his lifetime were still undone. In the last year, I've become very close to him. And in some ways, I, I value him very much as almost a father figure, someone to whom I can turn with my ups and downs. On Thanksgiving Day or Mother's Day, I get his text first. You know, there's no reason for that other than we feel a kind of connection and that connection has developed lately. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, President Tom Bailey. Thank you, uh, Provost Rowley. 
we are so delighted to be able to do this for our beloved professor. It is now my turn to extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you to this Gordon Centennial event at TC, the first of a series uh, that will unfold in the upcoming year. I have been tasked by uh, my partners, Erica and Amy, on the organizing committee to say a few words about how we came upon the main themes of our conference and their roots in Professor Gordon's works. For this, I will turn to a quote that is dated 1966. At that time, he said, in order to provide equality of education for disadvantaged children, we must identify the children and characterize the nature of their disadvantage. But psychoeducational testing and appraisal has more often been directed at establishing the fact and the quality of the deficit rather than on evaluating the quality and nature of the learner and learning. So that is, there were three points in that quote that inspired us as a group, inequalities, disadvantaged children, and the frustrations that Professor Gordon felt with methods of assessment and appraisal. The tools we use and rely upon for assessments, according to him, were missing the mark. They were not giving us any insights into the nature of the learner or sufficient insights into the learners, their qualities, and recognizing their life circumstances and disadvantages. So our professor's steady call has been for repurposing pedagogy and assessment towards affirmative development of every learner across the lifespan to support every learner, including the most disadvantaged among us in overcoming the barriers to success barriers to their agency, embracing their differences, but also with real understandings of who they are, their nature, their qualities, characteristics, and needs. And this is what this conference is going to be about. Next slide, please. So here we have the themes uh, uh, of our conference. Um, we have the immense good fortune to have been able to bring together what we believe are the best minds and foremost thought leaders to engage with Professor Gordon's ideas and take us into the future. On day one, we begin with the keynote address from Linda Darling Hammond, who will speak to the quest for educative assessments. Educative is a Gordon coinage assessments that educate. We will learn more about her perspectives on this key theme uh, very shortly at 11 o'clock. Don't forget to turn in. That will take us into sessions one and two that follow the keynote, all focusing on affirmative development. The first one on intellective competence and agency in human beings, and the second one on moving towards next generation affirmative pedagogies and um, to support social learning. That takes us to the second day. Don't miss the website. You need to register to be able to access and view various sessions live. The sessions will all be recorded and posted on the same tiles, so do register and um, you know, make sure that you are viewing the sessions. Um, our, the second day is going to be packed. We start with uh, um, speakers focusing on the next generation of affirmative and formative assessments of learning, leading into the session that will be equity-centered and looking at both legal and human rights issues and research policy and practice in pedagogy and assessment from affirmative action to affirmative development. Then uh, um, we move into what is called the reflection session. 
a very important session which will take us into the uh, future. And lastly, the closing ceremony. Don't miss that because Professor Gordon himself will be speaking. And lastly, uh, the final slide, I have a little birthday greeting. Not everybody turns 100 uh, and, um, and every day and we don't have a chance to celebrate their centennial birthdays. So thank you, Ed, for everything you have contributed. May this confluence of um, great minds and people at your centennial event serve as the way forward for us to build on your immense intellectual legacy. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it back to um, my colleague, Amy Wells, for whom Professor Gordon was also a major mentor. The way I've been mentored by Dr. Gordon has been in this very Dr. Gordon-ish way of not directly mentoring, but more mentoring through example, through the questions that he asked me, um, through his continued interest in my work and what I'm doing, really pushing a scholar to be better at what they're doing, to think about their work as it can impact the field by recognizing things that you're doing um, and by introducing you to other colleagues and other scholars whose work you should be connected to. It's a very special form of mentorship and one that I am trying to emulate myself. When I was the AERA president, I worked with a youth theater company here in New York called Epic Next Theater Company. It's high school students who do research on a particular topic and then write a script. I wanted them to do a play on assessment. So we went to Dr. Gordon's house with these five high school students. And throughout that whole time, I realized that he was so focused on them and their lives and what they were doing, what their school experience was like, and he was learning from them as they were interviewing him. And it was a really meaningful dialogue across these generations. And I was in awe, just realized how that's so symbolic of how he centers children and youth in everything he does. Dr. Gordon is such a connector. His idea around the development of my theme when I was the president of AERA was to have a consultative conversation. Well, you bring together people from different disciplines, different backgrounds, and you have a conversation. Like our field has become very fragmented and everybody's off doing their individual research and no one's really bringing it together to say what are the sum of these parts. And I feel like that's what Dr. Gordon has done and continues to do even as he's turning 100. And in an interdisciplinary field like education, if you're not doing that, you're not solving the big issues. You're not solving the big problems. We need to recognize that so many of the things that his mentees and his former students are doing are things that we wouldn't be doing if it hadn't been for him. I think a lot of us know in our hearts that that's why we're doing it. And, you know, as I mentor my doctoral students and the, the scholars coming behind me, I know in my heart that that's, I'm doing Dr. Gordon's work and they will do Dr. Gordon's work as well. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Madabi and Erica for getting us started. And thank you to Dr. Gordon for 100 years of a rich and productive life that has inspired this conference over the next two days and many more events throughout this centennial year. Happy birthday, Professor. Erica and Madabi and I wanted to start off by thanking so many people who have made this conference possible, especially Naila Nasir, the president of the Spencer Foundation and the current president of AERA for her vision and commitment and support for this conference. She helped us shape the themes. She, she provided so much input and great ideas that have made the conference what it is today and also helped to connect us with other funders for this event. So thank you also to Adam Gamerin, the president of the William T. Grant Foundation for joining us and Naila in organizing this event. And thank you to Kent McGuire and Peter Rivera at the Hewlett Foundation for also supporting this important conference. 
There's so many of our colleagues here at TC to thank for their work to bring these two days together, especially our events office led by Trish McNicholas, as well as our external affairs office ed by, led by Jim Gardner. And with a special shout out to Matt Vincent for his work on our website, Joe Levine for his research and writing, Heather Donahue for production and design, and Ho Chu Yen for her video editing and production. And a very special thank you to the TC students and recent alums who are now doing Dr. Gordon's work by working with us. They've spearheaded the conference organization and production, especially Xiao Shui Du, Benza Shin Gun, Jose Wilson, and Camille Wei. And special thank you to the Gordon Centennial Steering Committee led by Kenji Hakudu, Hakuda, who, has, um, who have allowed us to go first in this series of events this year. And we are the kickoff event. There are many more to come that you'll hear more about. And it's a real honor here to, at TC to be leading this work in this special year. Happy birthday, Professor. And now I'm turning it back to Erica, who's going to get us started on our um, keynote address. Thank you. Thank you both so much for, um, I think we make a great trio and it's so exciting to see this day come. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michelle Knight Manuel, who's professor of education at TC and the executive director of Teachers College Record. Michelle, welcome. I am delighted to introduce our keynote speaker today, Linda Darling Hammond. After Linda Darling Hammond shares on the quest for educative assessment, I will share some thoughts and then open it up for questions and answers. Many of you are well aware that Linda Darling Hammond is the Charles E. Dukum Professor of Education Emeritus at Stanford University and founding president of the Learning Policy Institute, created to provide high quality research for policies that enable equitable and empowering education for each and every child. She is past president of the American Educational Research Association and author of more than 30 books and 600 other publications on educational quality and equity, including the award-winning book, The Flat World in Education, How America's Commitment to Equity Will Determine Our Future. In 2006, she was named one of the nation's 10 most influential people affecting educational policy. She led the Obama educational policy transition team in 2008 and the Biden educational transition team in 2020. She was appointed president of the California State Board of Education in 2019. I would now, I would now like to invite Linda Darling Hammond to our virtual stage. Thank you so much, Michelle. It's great to see you. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Amy for all of her work to get this launched and Madhabi, whose comments actually set up my speech very well. So I appreciate all of you and everyone else who's worked on this, con on this conference. It is an honor and a privilege to be a part of this celebration of Ed Gordon's life and thinking. It's even more uh, of an honor to be part of this Teachers College celebration. Uh, where I came to know Ed and his beautiful wife, Susan, and their wonderful family. Um, and I came to know so many people at Teachers College uh, and in New York City who were doing extraordinary work to create equitable and empowering education for children. Uh, I was there as uh, the William F. Russell professor for about a decade uh, and learned so much about how to develop educative assessment uh, and um, intellective development, as Ed calls it, um, in my work both with the schools in New York and at Teachers College. So uh, it's very, very uh, inspiring to be able to be part of this particular celebration. Uh, Ed was the Richard March Ho Professor of Psychology and Education at Teachers College. Uh, he was the founder of the Institute for Urban and Minority Education. And during his years at Teachers College, he taught students and faculty, as well as researchers and policymakers in the city and nationwide, how to understand issues of development and learning, race and privilege, teaching and assessment, uh, and much, much more. 
that sets a very high standard. Uh, he uh, has spoken and written at length about what uh, the uh, role of social science researchers is uh, in the world, as well as in the development of knowledge in the field. In a piece in 1991, he noted, uh, quoting the work of uh, W.B. Du Bois, the politically transformative and liberating potential of the social sciences lies in the raising of explanatory questions relative to substantive and contextual data collection, critical analysis relevant to these issues, and the interpretation of the manner in which findings serve different interests, as well as to inform theory, policy, and practice, especially with respect to questions concerning oppressed groups. To treat them as if they were a mere scientific curiosity is a travesty against social and intellectual responsibility. <clears throat> we believe with Du Bois that we who are academically prepared and economically advantaged, and especially those of us who are black and or committed to justice, must not succumb to narrow academic self-satisfaction as our brothers and sisters struggle for day-to-day -day survival. We cannot afford to serve primarily aesthetic purposes, knowledge for knowledge's sake, with the intellectual tools that our ancestors sacrificed their lives to enable some of us to obtain. A component of liberatory scholarship is methodological rigor. Certainly this term applies to ardent efforts to produce and use efficient research tools, materials, and methodologies. However, this rigor also involves critical analysis. Rigorous intellectual initiative is inextricable in this process. Liberatory scholarship not only seeks to break the chains of oppression, but also the shackles of mediocrity. Critical analysis implores scholars to move forward in light of what they already know. And this call to action, along with Ed Gordon's continual example, has inspired so many of us to struggle more deeply with our data, for fuller understandings of the dynamics of social outcomes. It has moved us to speak more clearly about the implications of what it is we think we have come to understand about the ways in which society allocates resources and opportunities. It has compelled us to act more vigorously to affect these reforms our work persuades us could produce greater justice and equality for all children. Ed's eloquent assertion and demonstration that serious scholarship intellectual rigor and social responsibility are inseparable serves as an affirmation for me and many of my colleagues that our efforts to both comprehend and change an educational system which routinely places many students at risk are not only legitimate but necessary. His work has served as a beacon for many of us uh, who have sought models to help operationalize our beliefs that high standards for inquiry and high expectations for social consciousness and action are mutually reinforcing rather than contradictory. As a policy person, this call has been particularly poignant for me uh, with respect to assessment because assessment has so often been used to create and reinforce inequality and, and oppression. And so uh, I've learned from Ed how to think about the ways we conceptualize testing and assessment so that it is educative and supportive of learning rather than reductive, punitive, and a barrier to educational opportunity. Ed has always challenged conventional wisdom, the status quo and inequality in everything that he does, but always with that calm demeanor, that twinkle in his eye that makes people want to listen. One headline from an article about Ed captured this well. It said, always agitating, but never agitated. And I think that's one of the reasons that it has been able to get a wide audience uh, for the very radical thoughts uh, in the context of our society uh, that he has been pursuing for so many years. So what does Ed mean uh, by educative assessment? As you all know, and as has already been said, it has been from, uh, very, very productive for many, many years. And I'm going to quote from a piece that he published in 2020 um, in Educational Measurement called Toward Assessment in the Service of Learning. Uh, and what Ed means by educative assessment, he starts off in the article 
uh, by attributing to a teacher that he worked with in 1957, uh, a woman named Elsa Hauserman, uh, who wrote Developmental Potential of Preschool Teacher, uh, Preschool Children, an Evaluation of Intellectual, Sensory, and Emotional Functioning. Uh, he was uh, at that time a psychologist working as a psychometrician in the Pediatric Psychiatry Clinic at the Jewish Hospital of Brooklyn. Uh, and they uh, were working together around services for children with developmental disabilities. And um, Ms. Hauserman was a specialist uh, in the education of children who had experienced neurological impairment. Um, and so her assessments that Ed had the opportunity to watch in action uh, were more than measuring mental function and sorting children as educable or ineducable, which was part of the purpose of assessment in that context at that time. She wanted to know how the children functioned and the co conditional correlates of their performances. She felt that what she would do to help each of them learn and could be influenced and perhaps determined by how each learner used what they brought to the learning situation. Her educational assessments were time consuming. They resulted in descriptions of functions rather than scores. She wanted to know how the children being assessed went about succeeding or failing, rather than if the children passed or failed the tests. She produced an extensive report on how each learner executed the assessment performances, the possible implications of this information for her pedagogical intervention as a teacher. And from this richly detailed report of the functional educational assessment, uh, Ms. Hauserman developed a set of lesson plans for the conduct of teaching and learning transactions with that learning, with that learner. And this account, uh, d which was really aiming to make assessment more informative for teaching and learning processes, um, and ultimately, uh, as Ed has framed it, also more responsive to sensitivities and the diversities among people, uh, is what uh, educative assessment is really all about. And as I was reading this um, account of that experience, I thought about uh, schools and uh, uh, people and assessments that I encountered in New York City, where there's just a dramatic uh, creativity uh, and uh, innovative impulse in, the, in many of the schools there. I was there in the 1990s, uh, when many, many new schools were being designed and created, many of them by extraordinary teachers. I think about Deb Meyer and C.C. Cunningham and a variety of folks uh, who were uh, beginning schools all around the city, designing them so that they could be uh, supportive for children and uh, allow teachers to be efficacious. And the use of tools like the de developmental reading assessment uh, in which a teacher sits beside a, a child, um, watches them read, does a miscue analysis of their reading, uh, looks at what they are interested in reading, figures out how to uh, give them access to the kinds of tests at their independent reading level that will allow them to use the knowledge and excitement and curiosity that they have to continue to develop their skills, to look at the ways in which they uh, read, write, speak, listen, and build upon that knowledge to uh, enable them to grow further. Um, some people still use that assessment across the country, uh, but it falls in that diagnostic category that is rarely used for the testing that counts in our system today. I thought about the primary learning record, which was developed in England, which also documents uh, very carefully with observation children's learning and with artifacts of their work. Uh, I thought about the work that Bank Street College has done for years in developing teachers who have a very, very intense form of documentation for every child and look across developmental domains to see what uh, not only children are doing and can do, but what can be built on uh, in that zone of proximal development to push them forward uh, in their uh, growth and development in ways that continue to be engaging and exciting for the children. Um, so th these uh, kinds of assessment, I actually wrote a book about when I was at Teachers College with Beverly Falk and Jackie Ansess called Authentic Assessment in Action. Uh, we went around to schools, uh, mostly in New York, uh, to try to show how that uh, educative assessment set of strategies, which included the ones I talked about and also things like portfolio assessments, 
uh, in which students are developing work with support, uh, revising it to a standard in relation to rubrics, uh, and um, in the course of the assessment process, learning very, very deeply uh, about how to do the kind of work that they're engaged in. Uh, all of those kinds of things, I think, are exemplars of the educative assessment that Ed talks about. In this article, he identifies four uh, purposes of such assessment, uh, to measure the status of developed ability, to analyze processes of teaching and learning and becoming, to understand intentions, appreciations, uh, needs, meanings, and performances, and to cultivate learning and development of abilities, appreciations, competencies, and skills. Uh, I believe that this uh, approach, which is designed to teach and learn and support teaching and learning, not to sort and label uh, children is critically important. Uh, and that is uh, part of the, the challenge that we have experienced uh, with respect to uh, the way in which assessment has unfolded in this country. Uh, I want to note that uh, formal assessments, you know, assessment comes from the uh, Latin and then French word uh, uh, to sit beside, to see what someone is doing and to sit beside them and help them with that assessment, learn the next things that they have to learn. But assessment has been pulled out from that relationship. It is now uh, primarily uh, in terms of how schools experience it and kids experience it. External comes from the outside with decontextualized questions uh, most of them in multiple choice formats. So the cognitive activity is just picking one answer out of five and trying to figure out what the test maker has in mind, uh, even when there are more than one right answer, as we can find when we analyze many of the tests uh, or when the so-called right answer is questionable in, in some ways. Um, and that um, form of assessment came into this country in the early 1900s. Um, uh, Alfred Binet in France was developing assessments to try to figure out whether there were some students who could not benefit from the public education that was being created. And at the end of his uh, you know, um, studies and his design of an assessment, he basically concluded that most children uh, could do most things and that um, there were very few who could not benefit from the kind of education that was being developed. When that troubled over the ocean, uh, and uh, landed um, in part in the hands of um, Professor Terman at Stanford University, I am sorry to say, uh, that got transmuted into what has become sort of the artificial bell curve, finding a set of items that will array people on a single dimension against each other in a, uh, in a bell curve, uh, using um, techniques and, uh, and methods to determine which items have discriminatory power, and that is a double entendre, um, and uh, then to you know decide which things to throw away because they don't have such power, which to keep on the test. Uh, that uh, process of developing tests that could array people against one another was used to decide who was worthy of different kinds of education. Uh, that was born in the moment of the eugenics movement in this country, and Terman himself made a lot of statements about how some students uh, were not educated, were not able to be educated for thinking work. Um, he classified not only black students and Native American students and uh, Mexican American students in that classification, but also Eastern European students, and he arrayed them against each other in groups that should be tracked into different tracks. Now that happened as the factory model assembly line was being put in place in the early 1900s. And so the assessment system and the tracking system, which allocated different opportunities to people came together and tests have been used substantially for denying educational opportunities, for uh, deciding who gets uh, a rich intellectual education and who gets basic skills and road skills and preparation for um, you know, routine factory work as it was at one point in time, um, primarily. Uh, and it also has been used to do things like figure out who gets promoted to the next grade, who gets to graduate from high school. Um, in recent years, there was a, an era under No Child Left Behind where the tests were used to decide uh, which teachers 
would get um, continued in their um, in their employment, uh, and which schools would be closed uh, uh, as part of a punitive system of accountability. So uh, this this critical distinction about the purposes of assessment uh, is is very very important. Um, but during the 1990s, there were many uh, states uh, that were trying to develop educative assessments uh, in the years before No Child Left Behind. Uh, those were um, ended uh, in the early 2000s, uh, but we had states like Kentucky and Vermont, which had developed writing portfolios that students could um, uh, it, it could be integrated into uh, instruction. Students could develop their pieces of writing. They could be scored reliably and comparably using rubrics. Teachers would both see what students were learning uh, and thus be able to teach them more effectively uh, and be able to understand a standard of quality and be able to build on these assessments that occurred during the year to um, reach the next level of proficiency and competency uh, with their children. Uh, there were uh, various kinds of scientific investigations that were part of science assessments in Vermont and Connecticut, Delaware, and some other states. Um, in Connecticut, their approach was to have a uh, group project that students would do together. They would have a problem set for them. I remember one of them was, how do you build a statue that will withstand acid rain, which was a problem in New England at that time. Uh, they were given materials to experiment with. They designed their experiment together. The teacher said, okay, you're ready to go. They did their work uh, uh, and then they wrote up their data analysis findings and generalizations individually. And that was part of the assessment. At the end of the year, when they took another sit down test, uh, the two rolling up together into a common score, they would use the data from uh, what they'd learned. They would see examples of other students' experiments and then comment on them in terms of how replicable it was, how generalizable, what else would those students uh, need to do to be able to draw the next inference that would be defensible. A really deep, thoughtful, challenging work with teachers learning how to support them throughout the year and students learning how to be um, challenging and, um, uh, and ambitious in their learning. Uh, Connecticut actually sued the U.S. Department of Education when No Child Left Behind came in and they were told to stop doing those kinds of assessments um, and they were told to go find themselves some multiple choice tests. So we have, in fact, some knowledge base about these kinds of educative assessments. Um, in fact, they are common in many parts of the world, uh, and I describe them in a book called Beyond the Bubble Test with a variety of other scholars who uh, have been part of the development, design, and analysis and study of assessment systems that provide uh, the opportunity for deeper learning, uh, as well as the evidence of how that learning uh, unfolds. In his paper that I was uh, referring to a moment ago, uh, Ed talks about uh, various approaches to educative assessment. He talks about the way in which we can use gaming uh, as a basis for simulations and assessments, including stealth assessments in which we can kind of watch how kids are learning uh, without them even knowing they're being assessed as they play games that engage them in problem solving and critical thinking uh, and moves that are strategic. Uh, and, uh, of course, they learn in the process of doing that, um, that gaming as well. Uh, he talks about education portfolios of the sort that, uh, that I was describing. He uh, talks about the um, kind of diagnostic assessments uh, that need to be not only periodic uh, and frequent, but they need to go beyond multiple choice questions, which, as he notes, I will not provide evidence of why the student is selecting their answer or of how they're thinking about the question uh, that is uh, on the table. He talks about dynamic assessment, which measures a student's assisted performance to assess potential development or what the student is in the process of learning. So it is an actual assessment of process uh, as we watch students performing tasks um, in their zone of proximal development. He talks about dynamic pedagogy, 
and curriculum embedded assessments, uh, which integrate assessment curriculum and instruction in the service of learning. And I want to say that I've been involved in the recent um, months with uh, a number of chief state school officers, um, foundation leaders, uh, innovators in the elementary and secondary uh, school arena, uh, and others who are really asking for and seeking to develop and build upon efforts uh, to develop curriculum embedded uh, performance assessments so that teaching, learning, and assessment are fully integrated. And teachers are learning in the process of seeing how students uh, approach problems, think about them and perform. Students are learning as they have rubrics that give them feedback on their assessments uh, that they may themselves use, that their peers may use, that their teachers may use, so that they are deeply internalizing uh, the standards, uh, getting opportunities for feedback and practice and revision, which we know actually produces some of the strongest learning gains of any strategy uh, in the repertoire of uh, teaching uh, and pedagogy. So these kinds of things which uh, have been developed in some places, um, have been used around the world, are now in demand again. And our new Secretary of Education has made it clear that he wants us to evolve assessment systems that serve uh, the process of teaching and learning in those kinds of ways. Uh, Ed talks about learning cultures and catalytic assessments. Uh, where classroom social activities are deliberately designed and organized to catalyze, to catalyze the targeted forms of higher order thinking and cause them to develop through social interaction and self-directed learning opportunities. Uh, the purpose is really to develop and enhance the ability to think. Uh, and so he goes on and on with this uh, approach, to, multiple approaches to educative assessments that uh, really support learning. Uh, and finally, uh, he uh, emphasizes how performance-based assessments are critical uh, both to uh, create the kind of cognitive activity that students need to develop to become deep learners and to see what the results of that cognitive activity are. So we're at a moment, we're in an inflection point in the country that I think we can build once again uh, as we have done at various points over the decades on the ideas that Ed has been articulating. And it is so important that we move uh, to a form of assessment and a, a companion form of accountability uh, that will support children in their learning rather than um, undermining their learning. In fact, we now know that under No Child Left Behind, the punitive sanctions that were used in many schools in many states actually uh, deteriorated the quality of education for children as uh, good teachers left those schools. It became harder to recruit uh, trained and effective teachers into those schools. Um, and the nature of the work became more and more narrow and limited to the point where students were just drilling on multiple choice tests of reading and math, not getting science, social studies, arts, music, PE, all of which we know actually build brain capacity and neurological development of brain architecture. Uh, those things were be being set aside uh, and the kind of learning that would really develop what Ed calls intellective competence, was also being marginalized by the focus on uh, completing multiple choice tests in a fear-driven environment that further undermines the learning process. So we need to be thinking about uh, accountability as we think about assessment differently. My time is almost up, so I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I will just say that as I had began to look at accountability issues, in the policy space uh, and was struggling to formulate my own thinking uh, about, uh, about accountability, I discovered some years ago Ed's work on accountability and standards when he was the chairman of the New York City Public Schools Chancellor's Commission on Minimum Standards. And there back in 1989, uh, Ed and his colleagues articulated a view about how educational policies should be directed at fostering as well as mandating local school accountability uh, and doing that by 
allocating resources well, by defining goals and uh, improvement strategies thoughtfully, by engaging in productive teaching and learning processes, the real accountability for the quality and nature of the educational experience that kids have, have undertaken. I think it's time to revive that document uh, in our considerations uh, as well. Uh, so there is much for us to undertake. We are in a moment where much is happening. Um, in New York City, many of you may know the work of the New York Performance Standards Consortium, a group of schools that have been graduating students through these portfolio assessments with rich projects that are uh, revised to meet uh, standards reflected in rubrics presented to a, a panel, a, a, like a dissertation committee uh, at the end of high school. Uh, we find that students go on to college at higher rates and succeed in college at much higher rates than others because they are prepared to do what college demands of them in terms of thinking and inquiry uh, and uh, defending their ideas and inquiring into the ideas of others. Uh, that Performance Standards Consortium has spawned a California Performance Assessment Collaborative, which in turn has spawned a Hawaii Performance Assessment Collaborative and a North Dakota Performance Assessment Collaborative. We see the work in New Hampshire, where they are developing a system of performance assessment, local tasks, common tasks, uh, periodic standardized testing, but uh, a cycle that is very educative and is the focus of educators' attention. Um, we see the advanced placement program saying that they're about to plant, uh, having already planted projects uh, and uh, performance tasks in some of the courses and getting ready to do that for the remaining AP courses. Uh, we see the Smarter Balanced Assessment System that has performance tests, getting ready to take those out of the end of the year test and bring them into the classroom. Uh, we see the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards, uh, teacher portfolio, uh, which asks teachers to show what they can do uh, by actually doing it uh, and uh, tape, videotaping their teaching and reflecting through commentary on the decision making that they make. We've got studies now that show that teachers who achieve that are more effective. Uh, they are also more effective as mentors for beginning teachers and they uh, inspire greater teaching among their colleagues as well. So we see the educative power of uh, those kinds of assessments uh, now being uh, also thought through at the um, beginning teacher preparation level. States are ready to move uh, in this direction. As uh, the head of the Biden transition team, I had the honor to meet with many, many stakeholders during the transition. One meeting was with more than 30 state chiefs who came together uh, right before Christmas time to explain what they wanted to see in assessment. And all of them talked about both educative assessment that could inform teaching and learning as a goal that they want to undertake uh, and uh, accountability focused on opportunity to learn uh, rather than sanctions and punishments in response to test scores. So in the years to come, I think we will see progress toward Ed's goal of uh, educators uh, building a system of education that uh, empowers every child. Of course, Ed would have us act on what we learn. And as he noted uh, in 1991 in Psychological Science, of course, the title of scholar, intellectual, doctor, or professor does not make a person responsible for the state of humanity. However, it does entail the responsibility to provide the conceptual leadership which enables society to engage in self-corrective action. And this is an important time for all of us to be able to do, uh, to take on the mantle that Ed proposes for us. I wanna close with the words of Gus Hawkins, who was the father of Title I, a California congressman, uh, who uh, talked about leadership in a way that I think uh, really describes it, Gordon. He said, the leadership belongs not to the loudest, not to those who beat the drums or blow the trumpets, but to those who day in and day out, in all seasons, work for the practical realization of a better world, those who have the stamina to persist and to remain dedicated. Ed has been this kind of leader, and I am thrilled that we are celebrating him today and planning how we will continue his legacy. 
Thank you, Linda Darling Hammond, for sharing some significantly important and insightful ideas about educative assessments that resonate with some of the ideas that I would like to share in the next few minutes about meaningful learning, equity, and assessment during a time of a global health pandemic and social racial reckoning here in the United States. I would like to begin with a quote by Edmund Gordon from the book Affirmative Development in the chapter Politicalization and Neglected Pedagogical Process, in which he compels us to think of the role of social justice in education. And I quote, we have tended to think of social justice as a value that we are morally committed to pursue for the underprivileged, for ethnic minorities, or for any low status group. However, as Edmund Gordon argued 15 years ago, and it is still true today, that the absence of justice is more than a moral problem. It is incompatible with the purposes of education. It is a threat to the economic and political stability of the society. With respect to education, he further argues that full engagement in the pedagogical process and optimal educational outcomes are impossible without it. Thus, as we begin to think about the ways in which social justice and pedagogical processes undergird more human, humanizing educative assessments, I question, what are the student learning experiences we seek through educative assessment? And how can such assessments support the whole child in such pedagogical processes as culturally relevant teaching that Gloria Ladlin Billings notes empower students socially, emotionally, intellectually, and civically. In 2019, Jenny Muniz noted that all 50 states incorporate some aspect of culturally responsive teaching within their professional learning, their professional teaching standards. And more recently, Amy Stewart Wells and Diana Cordova Covo noted in their Century Foundation report that 36 states have already submitted their accountability plans that include some aspect of cultural responsiveness or competence as pedagogical requirements. And I would like to share two lessons and two examples from educators who are designing culturally relevant learning school environments from a research and development project during COVID-19 and in the midst of social racial reckoning. Joanne Marciano and I sought to build professional capacity of educators and administrators to engage in more meaningful, authentic learning and assessments through culturally relevant education across several schools. The first example I would like to share resonates with the comprehensive assessments that 400 educational researchers deem necessary in a letter addressing how schools can help children recover from COVID school closures. As schools become more student-centered and focusing on the whole child, they will open up spaces for more student-teacher relationships that provide opportunities to focus on the social emotional aspects of learning for children to thrive. Educative assessments are needed in sustaining a culturally relevant school-wide learning environment. As many educators are saying, before one can begin to think about academic learning and assessment, it is necessary to consider the trauma that many of our students have experienced. And after a year of virtual um, PD on culturally relevant education, we asked schools to tell us what were some of their top takeaways that would be important for them to enact coming back to school and creating more relevant and equitable learning environments for their students. One educator noted that it's important to, suspect, to support students' social and emotional development and well-being. She goes on to say how it's important for teachers to be able to notice students, especially when they come back, because we don't know what students have gone through, what circumstances that took place during the pandemic. Some students have experienced death, multiple deaths, and had no one to really talk about it. One approach to understanding our, our students' circumstances and what is needed to support their learning is to begin what they're calling morning roundtable talks, where children can talk about what's going on in their lives. And these roundtable spaces serves as learning to get to know students and provide that emotional support, introduce students to resources that they might have in the building that they might not know of, and also to refer students to the appropriate staff who can support the students much better. Certainly this educator and many others are speaking to the wraparound services that include building trusting relationships with students and providing resources that continue to support their well-being and learning in more holistic ways. In sum, 
As one participant shared, during this pandemic, pandemic, we are used to being sensitive to the lives of students, as every student has lived a different life during this pandemic. While many are focused on the effects of COVID-19, participants also asked us to be equally concerned with the social unrest in the country and what it means for our democracy. And as I share this second example, I think about the ways in which Edmund Gordon also asked us to consider what are the optimal levels of achievement that we seek, as well as the learning experiences needed to achieve them. He later goes on to argue that the meta products of effective academic learning are reasoning ability, problem solving ability, perspective, and judgment. The emphasis on learning experience and outcomes leads to what he calls certain skills and human abilities that can be developed through appropriate activity. So one social studies teacher highlighted for us how she's engaging in culturally relevant practices that provide opportunities for students to think about what the type of democracy they want to live in in the United States. She shared the importance of taking into account issues of race, the multiplicity of cultures in her school and society, and hope for a better world. During one of our meetings, uh, this particular educator noted that she understands what standards are saying and what she has to teach by the end of the year. She says it's all important, but there are other things that we need to bring into the classroom. We need to have those moments where we're getting to know students and have activities where student voices are directing the learning. She said like a couple of weeks ago when a student asked, why has the school not done anything for Asian Pacific and Islanders for three years? She then allowed them to decide on what the student projects would be that would emphasize um, the ways in which Asian Pacific Islanders have contributed not only to this country, but in ways that are important for all of us to consider. She goes on to share that she thinks it's important that we not just teach curriculum, but kind of wrap it into what's going on in their own lives. And for instance, when the whole Derek Shaven verdict came out, she decided to do two weeks on it. She emphasized how we need to expose them to other things that you know, current events, what's going on in the world today, how does it connect to the past? Especially knowing from her perspective that there are a lot of people today who want to erase the past. I think it's very dangerous to do that, she says. I think our kids need to be exposed to what happened in the past, learn and grow from that and become better people. In sum, we realize she's advocating for academic work that promotes authentic learning and the ability to address racial and ethnic in inequities of the past and present. And why? In order to be better people. In encouraging more authentic learning, she wanted to present opportunities that reflect how students acquire and use knowledge to solve real world problems that we know are increasingly needed in our society today. These two examples on meaningful learning that address the impact of COVID-19 on students and their families and the current racial and ethnic inequities demonstrate how social justice in education reveals how the school cannot go back to normal teaching, learning, and assessment processes, but rather see schooling as transformative through more culturally relevant learning and assessment environments that seek to provide more affirming and equitable opportunities for all children. I would like to invite Linda Darling Hammond back to our virtual stage as we have time to answer one or two questions. And the first question I would like to uh, share with you, uh, Linda Darling Hammond, is um, formative assessments in education, what we consider a form of educative assessment, has been in the literature for decades now. Why do you think we have faced serious barriers to implementing formative assessment in schools? And what can we do to reverse this? Well, I think that, um, you know, some schools, of course, do uh, engage in, and teachers all the time engage in informal formative assessment. Uh, but I think that really doing uh, something like what we've been just talking about in, in these talks is um, made more challenging by the fact that we've put so many stakes that affect uh, so many people on this end of year high stakes assessment, um, which as one chief state school officer said to me is kind of like an autopsy at the end of the year. You sort of, you know, wait until you get there and see what, you know, happened. Uh, and because that is like the, 
driver and it was designed in the policy to be a driver of practice, people then mirror the type of items on that test, the way that it tries to characterize knowledge uh, in the work that they're doing in building up to the test. I don't think it works. There's been this idea that you would have this sort of uh, multiple choice test at the end of the year that would drive uh, a lot of decision making and then tell teachers and schools, go ahead and do these other formative assessments that might be rich learning examples and da -da -da, you know, have all of these opportunities for figuring out how people think and do because they're so dissociated with one another. And it's mm -hmm. hard for teachers to feel comfortable uh, engaging in work that is not going to reflect the way in which students are being evaluated. So at the end of the day, we need assessment systems in which all of the pieces uh, integrate, in which all of the assessments are worth taking and doing, are thoughtful, are open-ended to a much greater extent, give teachers access to the process for their students. Uh, and uh, you know we, we're going to have to think about uh, what investments need to be made for that to be the case. When I look at uh, the way in which assessment occurs, for example, in um, many other countries, um, in Singapore, in the International Baccalaureate System, which some people will have encountered. Kids are doing projects and papers. They're doing scientific investigations, which they may have designed themselves, uh, keeping journals of their scientific process, uh, which are scored by teachers and which are part of an assessment system which values intellectual, intellectual production not just finding one right answer out of five, which I think when you do that uh, you know, for a, a long period of time, uh, it is frankly cognitively debilitating to train mm -hmm. people to think that that is the end result of intellectual activity is to find right. one right answer out of a list of five that someone else has already given you. Yeah. Uh, the number of hours in American classrooms spent on people trying to figure out how to eliminate the obvious wrong answer, figure out the, <laughs> you know, what the right answer might be, and then guess between right. the two last options. You know, crazy things that have nothing to do with learning to think and perform and be a member of a community and do well in the world. So we, we uh, can't get to the high quality assessment utility in a large scale way until we change those assessments that right now uh, prove to be um, you know, a major barrier to the right kind of learning. I appreciate how you brought in this global aspect of assessments and how we can learn from one another uh, as we move forward thinking about educative assessments. Um, the second question we would like to uh, share with you uh, has to do with the ways in which in special education, teachers are trained to design, select, and apply indi individualized educative assessments to shape the development of challenging populations. Is the model for special education teachers in individualized student assessment effective for mainstream teachers? I think that's a lovely image that does not actually play out in lots of schools. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, we, we have, um, it is the image of what special education is meant to do. It's mm -hmm. meant to be diagnostic. It's meant to figure out what children, you know, know and are doing and then really guide both the assessments and the um, learning processes to, to those needs in a very uh, iterative and dynamic way. And so, yes, I think that's what we ought to do. I wish that we're what actually happens in special education, but we have a huge shortage of special education teachers across the country. Lots of people who are doing that work are not trained at all, even for any kind of teaching. Uh, children often get um, something much less than, uh, than what the um, ideal is for special education. Um, but I do think that the, that the idea of the model is, is one for us to strive for. And again, it's going to require policies. And I will say I was very pleased that President Biden's plan that has come out both in the American Families Act, um, in uh, ARPA, and in the first budget uh, does put a lot of investment in the training of teachers, uh, bringing people in to high quality programs, uh, yes. So they can graduate without debt. There's additional resources in um, IDEA for right. special education, teacher development, and the development of uh, college programs for that. So mm -hmm. these things go together. 
Yes. You, you, the educative assessments and the kind of teaching and learning that you described, Michelle, yes. goes along with the investments in the uh, knowledge base and the expertise of the teaching force. And we okay. need policies that promote those at the same time. Great. This is indeed some very good news that you're sharing um, about the possibilities for our future right now. Um, and so as you talk about the policies that we need to think about, what do you think are some of the policy barriers to implementing educative assessments in schools? And how do we or can we influence policymakers to prioritize resources for more equitable educative assessments for diverse learners? Well, we've started to talk about some of those. You know, we need to get to the place that, you know, we're describing, which is not just educative assessment. As you said, it's, and as, as I said, it's uh, teaching, learning, it's culturally uh, responsive and connected to students' experiences, uh, in which assessment is a, a tool for this kind of dynamic process of self-actualization for, for children and young people, uh, of helping them develop their potential, rather than you know labeling them and sorting them into different levels and types of our educational opportunity. So we have to change policy about the use of assessment, as well mm -hmm. as changing and investing in the development of different kinds of assessments. Uh, there's a whole psychometric uh, underpinning for the way we have been designing tests that needs right. to evolve uh, as well. We need to invest deeply in the preparation of teachers and school leaders so yeah. that they deeply understand learning and development in social cultural contexts so that they deeply understand curriculum and learning progressions so they can help students you know make progress on those learning uh, progressions uh, and that you know the investment in a in a deep profession is yeah. you know fundamental to achieving the goals that we have if you look at finland uh, they were one of the low performing schools in um, Scandinavia and in Europe. They were a nation of, you know, fishermen and uh, lumberers or whatever you call the people who cut down trees. 10% uh, of people had finished high school in 1970. They had a major reform. The biggest part of it was preparing all teachers in these very deep two-year master's programs with model schools connected to universities where they learn to train. Uh, when PISA came out in the year 2000, the other thing they did was equitable resourcing. They got right. rid of tracking. They got rid of the testing and tracking system that they had had, uh, but they replaced it with deeply knowledgeable teachers working in equitably resourced schools. And in 2000, and since then, they rose to the top of PISA. Uh, everybody was like, what? How did that happen? Uh, we have to understand that the... Uh, investment in the people uh, and then the equitable resources that allow them to do their work and then a system that focuses on meaningful learning right. is the design for the type of uh, overall education system mm -hmm. as well as accountability and assessment that will help us develop our people so that everyone uh, emerges with knowledge, skills, commitments, passions, civic mm -hmm. engagement, finding a path to their future. Um, yes. That is the one that is right for them yes. and, and feeds their soul uh, and allows them to contribute to society. Thank you. Well, I certainly hope that we can seize this moment. It is a moment of opportunity for us to reimagine education and uh, I just want to thank you, Linda Darling Hammond, for kicking us off with this great celebration for Edmund Gordon. And certainly your ideas will continue throughout this conference as we think through uh, some of the very thorny issues you've raised for us to think about going forward. And so I would like to say to our guests who have come today, thank you so much. Uh, and we welcome you to return at 1230 for our next session. Thanks, Michelle. You're great welcome. to see thank you. you.